Mm. All right. Ah, oh, good to have you here. Hi, hi, um, Lauren, Susanna. Yeah, so good to have you here. Let's um, begin as you know, we, we do here. We just start with a, um, a few moments to arrive. So closing the eyes, if you like or not, but we just take a few moments to bring our awareness into our bodies and just start to sense what the aliveness is like. You know, as we feel into our bodies and notice what it's like just to have a body. Like I know for me, there can be this like, oh, that's right, that's right, I have a body. Because there's often a way in which we're leaning forward so we can notice that now. And we can give ourselves uh, the benefit of like giving this practice your undivided attention. All right, so we're sort of setting the stage. Closing all the browsers that you have open. Letting yourself really commit to just being here and receiving what it is that you're here to receive and to trust that it's enough. And then you might touch in on, yeah, like what uh, your energy level's like. What's the emotional terrain like in your heart? How is the mind? Is the mind preoccupied with anything in particular? And then just overall sort of like how present, how present do we feel? And just that inquiry, right? Can tend to close the gap between where we are and um, where we think we should be. And then you might notice what your intention is, what it is that you're most wanting to feel or receive. It could be connection, it could be peace, it could be joy. Acceptance, there might be something else. Just take your time. And then we'll take a nice deep breath in and bring our palms together if you like, and we can just seal that with a bow. And then go ahead and put in the chat um, what, yeah, like, how are you doing? What are you noticing about how you are in this moment? And what is your intention? We'll go about, you know, 50 to 55 minutes or so, about a half the time we, we start with the talk um, after this arrival meditation, and then um, we practice and I'll guide you through a, a meditation that uh, is meant to be aligned with what we're talking about. So let me see, Ruth, I'm trying to get deeper into my body. Yeah, I run around in my head constantly. Thanks, Ruth. Happy Tuesday, Lauren. Yeah, glad to see you all here and be here. Yeah, glad you're here. The energy is shifting and I can feel many things happening. My intent is to settle a bit. Yes, okay, great. All right, let's dive in. So again, 
you know, it's nice, like as, as the tradition is when a Dharma talk is offered, which this is what that is. And in, in, in the embodied mindfulness school, um, the talks tend to be a blend of, um, you know, yeah, Buddhist psychology, uh, Dharma, you know, teachings from the suttas, but there's also, you know, other things that, that come into play here. Um, really supposed to be and meant to be supportive to any kind of like other practices that you have, you know, so, um, uh, and we just, you know, for the talk, it's like about just settling in and softening the skin and letting yourself receive from a place of relaxed, you know, alertness. And then just noticing sort of what stands out to you as we explore this really, 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 really important terrain of, um, you know, so, we're talking about the eight worldly concerns <laughs> um, and, and why, what does that mean? Well, because what's in the way of the peace that we seek and what's in the way of our birthright of peace and um, is this way that we bind ourselves or we yoke ourselves to craving or blaming, right? To grabbing and pushing away. We kind of get caught in these cycles of hope and fear. And we're gonna unpack more about that so we can have a clear understanding of this because awareness and brightening our awareness about the ways that we get caught helps free us from it. It's not about not having um, the eight worldly wins, like about the eight worldly concerns. It's not about that. It's about like clearly understanding that, yes, we encounter these all the time, all the time. And um, it's normal when we're human and we have a body. Hence, like, that's right. If you're human, you have a body. But um, to be, like, really, really, really um, focused on opportunity and threat, trying to control uh, or just trying to even just anticipate, which is a way of control, what's out there so that I can feel okay in here. Now, the desire to feel okay in here is, is, is wholesome right? Without that desire, um, right? We don't go on, we don't search, but we've gotten confused about what actually brings us true peace. And it's not about having things the way we want them. And why? Because things are always changing and we know it. So um, any way that we hinge our ultimate, like, sense of okayness on any of the things I'm about to unpack, um, we, we, we create more, you know, more suffering, more pain for ourselves. So um, the Buddha said, <clears throat> uh, so what we're going to be doing also is we're going to uncover a practice for trusting imperfect peace, trusting imperfect peace. And first, we're going to understand the ways we yoke ourselves to craving and blaming. And the Buddha said, praise and blame, gain and loss, pleasure and sorrow, come and go like the wind. To be happy, rest like a giant tree in the midst of them all. Praise and blame, gain and loss, pleasure and sorrow. Okay, so it's important that we start to see these things uh, that I'm going to, you know, that we're going to talk more about right now. But these are things that are um, bound to happen. Part of being human and being in, in this sort of like realm is this impermanence. So 
given that things are changing all the time, doesn't make sense for us to hinge our, uh, you know, our, our, our enoughness, our okayness on these things that can change. And, um, and so we'll talk about these things that, you know, um, we want to be aware of recognizing that to believe that any of these things will, will ultimately satisfy is, uh, is the problem. (laughs) It's not that these things arising are the problem but it's our belief in the moment when we're caught in it that um, it's gonna ultimately satisfy. So praise and blame. I am just gonna take this, so we're gonna break up praise and blame, gain and loss, pleasure and sorrow. Um, And then we'll talk about to be happy, rest like a giant tree, like what's the practice for that? Uh, But I'm taking this from Judy Leaf. I loved this uh, piece that she wrote in Lion's Roar um, about the eight worldly concerns. And so I'm just going to read directly because I just, I thought you would, you would uh, benefit from this as, as I did. So she frames it as happiness versus suffering, the first two worldly concerns, happy versus happiness versus suffering. And then she says, once we have happiness, fear arises, for we are afraid to lose it. When suffering arises, no amount of wishful thinking makes it go away. The more we hope for it to be otherwise, the more pain we feel. Right? So if we're hitching our sense of enoughness, okayness, peace, if we're yoking it to, um, you know, this kind of fleeting emotion of happiness, then uh, we suffer, right? And vice versa, because there's a part of us that knows that it will change. Then we like want to hold on to it. and, And then we really get in a pickle right? Um, Fame versus insignificance, three and four. We are obsessed with fame and afraid of our own insignificance. When it dawns on us how hard we need to work to be seen as someone special, our fear of insignificance is only magnified. Right, so yoking our sense of okayness or enoughness onto being special, right? Being significant, being different, we suffer. Because it's like, it's really exhausting to try to always work to be someone right? It's so exhausting to feel like you have to be proving your significance all the time. You know what I mean? Like they say, if you don't post it on social media, it's almost like it didn't happen. And so I think, you know, too, but it's never, but this has been around for a really long time. So it's, I think I, you know, social media definitely amplifies our self-consciousness in good and not so good ways, a lot of not so good ways. (laughs) One of them is here. We get preoccupied with um, how we're viewed and being special, being significant. And that suffer, that causes us to suffer. Five and six are praise versus blame. We need to be pumped up constantly or we begin to have doubts about our worth. When we're not searching for praise, we're busy trying to cover up our mistakes so we don't get caught, right? Hopefully, just this is illuminating for us. We want to replace any judgment with curiosity. We just want to get more aware of how these um, come into our own lives, which 
likely is happening for you as you're listening to this. Seven and eight, gain versus loss. Just as we are about to congratulate ourselves on our success, the bottom falls out. Over and over, things are hopeful one moment and the next they are not. And in either case, we are anxious. And I think that, you know, it's like, who wants to hear that? <sighs> you know, people who are really interested in something that is unshakable are open to hearing this because it's true, right? You can't yoke your sense of enoughness and okayness to success or a certain measure of success, right? Because all of these things, when we... Um, when we bind our attention to them, we, when we entrust our sense of okayness to them, cause us to feel that anxiety, like, you know, something's always missing. We can't ever really relax. And, and the, pro, you know, and it's important for us to see it's because in a moment of craving candy. I have to like think of something for my, you know, like something simple that I can really relate to here that we can all relate to. Um, like for me, like candy, you know, it's like it easily can go from, you know, like five, <laughs> five red vines to like whatever the whole box or like Swedish fish or, you know, good and plenty. Um, those are some of my favorite candies, but it's like, if I don't catch the craving, then I, if I keep eating, right, you know, it's like past that point of you're not really satisfying anything. You're not really being satisfied. If you were, you would just need one. But in that moment, I'm unconsciously believing that that's going to do it. When we see that, we kind of go, wait, wait a second. This is not going to do it. But it feels like it will. And it's important to understand that, to start to bring more awareness to that, to the ways that craving, grabbing, addiction, wanting, right? And aversion, pushing away. I don't want it. I don't like it. The way that we do do that as humans and it causes us to suffer and so we want to you know bring more awareness to it because as we bring more awareness to it we start to create some space and then we can yoke our attention to something more trustworthy which i'll get to um and it's really important that we have a lot of kindness towards this predicament you know, like if it's just because we're, we get caught so much and if we're judgy, then we really can't change this or we can't um, be freed from it because shame has a way of binding us to these things, which is why, you know, addictions can get so entrenched and hard to like move away from, even when we can clearly see it's causing harm. Um, so we can yoke ourselves to something else, which I said, said earlier, but uh, it's, it's like not bad news <laughs> that success and the bottom falls out when our sense of okayness and enoughness isn't hitched to it. And this is true freedom. And I think Dana Falls really points to this beautifully in this poem that I've shared, like I shared back in the beginning of May, but it's called Allow. She says, there is no controlling life. Try corralling a lightning bolt containing a tornado. Dam a stream and it will create a new channel. Resist and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow and grace will carry you to higher ground. The only safety lies in letting it all in. The wild and the weak fear, fantasies, failures, and success. When loss rips off the doors of the heart or sadness fills your vision with despair, practice becomes simply bearing the truth. 
In the choice to let go of your known way of being, the whole world is revealed to your new eyes. So there is a different way of approaching life than the way that we've been taught and really indoctrinated into. And it shows up for us in the stresses of perfectionism. It shows for up, up for us in the stresses of the rat race, insecurity, unconscious habits that make life feel dull and heavy. This hungry ghost of wanting more and more, but never being satiated. And then also there's this aspect of kind of a perpetual enragement. So these are more kind of personality traits that will show up or, you know, it's like that. Uh, being in the rat race, you know, perfectionistic, needing things to be and look a certain way. Um, all of these are ways that it can show up for us in our life. Um, yeah, yeah, being always angry, just always mad. Uh, you know, this is from Judy Lee. It is one thing to recognize what we would like to attract and what we would prefer to get rid of. And quite another to be obsessed with getting our way and terrified of things going wrong. So she points here to it's okay to have preferences. It's okay to set up your life to be successful. It's good, <laughs> right? It's good. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about, it's, it's, but it's about holding these things more loosely. We create, so it's like what she says, quite another to be obsessed with getting our way so and terrified so the obsessed and the terrified those things can tell us we're too caught like we are our due north our north star is like we've been mistaken we've been caught uh we've put worldly things on the altar so to speak because we are of the world right i do love good and plenty Right. And I do love art and I love culture and I love nice clothes. <laughs> right. And I love, you know, I love these things like being human. It's like one of the things as my teacher is like, you know, like food, for example, it's like one of the things that makes life wonderful. So it's not about these things being wrong. Like we're supposed to be some aesthetic that turns away from the world. No. It is one thing, as she says, to recognize what we would like to attract and what we would prefer to get rid of, right? That seems like the healthier way to relate to the worldly concerns, but quite another to be obsessed and with getting our way and terrified, terrified of things going wrong. So let's talk about refuge. Okay, let's like, I want to just take a moment with that and we'll all take a deep breath in. We're just going to, we're pivoting now to the refuge. What is true refuge and what can we have confidence in? Because things really changed for me when I understood that practice wasn't about, that freedom and peace weren't about or concerned with me having some like really calm, clear mind or something, or to have a body without anxiety. You know, a lot shifted for me when I realized that there was actually a way I could direct my attention. And I come back to this again and again in my own practice. Like I am right here with everyone as I'm teaching this stuff. But we remember that there is a refuge. And in order to have refuge amidst these worldly concerns, amidst them, not in spite of them, not because of them, but amidst them, what we want to think about is cutting through this cycle. And part of understanding the cycle is understanding, as we emphasize, like here in the Embodied Mindfulness School, embodied mindfulness, the centers of the body. So we're going to get really tactical here. And we talk about, you know, this 
feeling, right? If you, all of us can kind of feel into the length of the spine. And we have like the head center, the heart center and the belly center. Where, where do we get caught, right? Here. And then how this is communicating to this without the belly center. So that gives us some clues around refuge, right? We want to cut through the cycle. We want to stop feeding the head center with our attention, which is not easy. That's why it's called practice. <laughs> and that's why we come together in Sangha, because it's like we all remember together, oh, right, it's okay to not think about that thing right? It's okay to withdraw the awareness from that and bring it down into the belly center, even though it kind of feels like we should be thinking all the time, right? There's kind of, we're so used to it. A lot of what we do in Sangha is remind each other that there's another way and that that way is um, indeed wholesome and like we encourage each other to go there. Um, so we create choice. We talked about, you know, what we do, open up the space, start to create choice. By one of the ways we do that is by um, sinking into the belly. It's by drawing our awareness away from the head center. And we'll practice with this when we sit in a minute or two. And by yoking our attention to something more stable and trustworthy. We replace, as I mentioned a few times, judgment with curiosity. And another part of refuge is learning to lean into the sharp points. I don't know where we have this idea. Like, it's like, no one, I guess no one really is uh, uh, maybe taught us what it's like to be in these bodies that are very vibrant and very uh, electric and very like the heart is very feeling full. I mean, it's really normal to feel big feelings as humans, like on the daily. And the fact that no one trained us to do this and it's no one's fault, but we can, you know, that's what we do here, has us kind of freaked out, right? chronically startled by our own inner world. And, um, and so leaning into the sharp points can help us remember that, yeah, life can feel edgy and it's okay. We don't have to like, we, you know, it's okay. We want to normalize that to, to, to some degree, which is why learning to be in the body and kind of understanding, not just understanding, but like for me over the years, it's been like a, a slow and gradual toleration and then love and acceptance, right? Of different parts of myself. But the only way to make that connection is to sustain awareness in our bodies. Um, it's not hard, but it's not, it's real easy to forget. And it seems like a lot less compelling than the, uh, the, the uh, melodramas that we create in our minds, which are much more titillating and much more attractive. <laughs> um, even if it's like a nightmare, you know, it, it has a certain gravitational pull um, that we want to renegotiate and give to the belly center. If our experiences are just what they are, nothing more and nothing less, we can see they are not out to get us, nor are they a confirmation. They are simply the impersonal play of causes and conditions. And that's from Judy Lee. The last piece I want to talk about in terms of refuge is, um, and creating refuge is equanimity. And we'll be practicing this when we sit together. Um, and we'll end our meditation today with a, an equanimity uh, recita recitation <laughs> um, 
just saying that these phrases that help us find harmony and balance come what may. And strength within ourselves, right? To be as the Buddha talked about, stand as a tree amidst them all. You think about any really, really good leader, not but a good leader, what defines a good leader is a sort of imperturbability. Yeah. You know, this, this ability to, you know, withstand, I think about Deepama, right? The Buddhist nun or practice. She wasn't a nun, actually. She was a lay person, but she was a Buddhist teacher. I've talked about her. There's a talk you can find on YouTube. If you look at my channel, look for Deepama. But I mean, so much, right? She really learned like there was a deeper refuge because of like her life, you know, challenged her in such a way that, which is true for a lot of us, we find this path because it's like, you know, like it's like we are deep seekers, right? And likely our life has presented us with a certain cocktail of challenge that has really forced us beyond the worldly concerns. We haven't, you know, and so here we are and lucky, us, right? You know, um, it's, you know, it's helpful to see whatever struggles we've had through that lens at the same time, acknowledging, um, you know, the challenge of it is important. So we're not like bypassing ourselves spiritually. Um, let's go ahead and settle into our posture. <clears throat> Let me get my bell. I have roses on the altar for you. Pink ones. If you're on a chair like me uh, and cross legs and feet on the floor. I find, and you know, let's pro we'll practice this way together. It's really common for um, meditation to be taught with eyes closed and for us to practice that way. But just for today, um, because it has a certain, uh, a lot of our thoughts are visual. We close our eyes and the gravitational pull of images can be even stronger, right? So if we have our eyes open with a soft gaze, We can just practice with that together today. And then let a wave of ease descend down the body. Let yourself be five or 10% more at ease. We really want to get a sense of this whole body, like being in our bodies, whatever our sense of that is today. We want to let this be an anchor. Like something that we um, sustain throughout our sit. particularly drawing awareness to the feeling of breathing. And how it, it moves us, like especially in the front axis of the body, how it moves the front axis of our bodies. 
So I'm gonna ring the bell and then we'll just sit together in silence for, um, for a few minutes to let our awareness settle. Every breath feels different in the body. Notice that. No two breaths feel the same. We can allow our awareness to start to sink a little more. Just let it sink. All the way down the spine. To the area of the lower abdomen. Letting the abdomen, the low belly, just soften. In a natural way, you might invite the breath. To just expand the belly in a natural way. However, it might be subtle or the top of the inhale, there's a, a little bit of a Buddha belly happening. Awareness just sort of dwell down here. However, that occurs to you, you can trust it's right. Awareness might move kind of up into the head center, and we can just really easily and effortlessly let it sink back down if we become aware of that.
We'll just become quiet now and we can work with that. Or just tend to that. It might start to get complicated and we can just let awareness free relax. Just letting awareness sink down. Just a little simpler down here. There's a lot of aliveness in here. It's changing. We have moments of experiencing pleasant and unpleasant or neutral. Maybe relaxed and then anxious and then grateful and then something else. Or less bouncy. With it when we're trusting in the belly center, 
we can come back and taste this refuge again and again and again and again. Bring a hand to our chest, reminding ourselves of, as we practice, just of kindness to have this little bit of friendliness or gentleness. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. May I find harmony and balance. Come what may. May I find strength within myself. May I be happy. Continuing to recite these phrases in a cadence that is soothing to you.
blessings to you. Thank you for sitting with me, with us and coming. Um, yeah, really good to practice with you. And just to remember too that, you know, for today, it can be nice to remember that we'll be practicing together, right? Practicing this true refuge and remembering that this is actually something we could practice. And a lot of it has to do with the conscious movement of awareness from yoking to this, to this. And then just kind of working with that and seeing how that, um, how that is today as you bring awareness to, to the eight worldly winds <laughs> and kind of like have humor around how you know, caught we can get. Um, so uh, what are uh, takeaways, Ruth or um, Lauren, you know, from today? I like to mention that these are offered, uh, freely offered and your donations really make a difference. So thank you, thank you. There's gonna be a button beneath this video where you can, uh, that you can push to, um, to donate and also subscribe to YouTube. Uh, all these are uploaded to YouTube. Oh. There's a little hummingbird that just flew right in front of us. Yeah. Um, I also have uh, my, um, I think we might be filled. So I don't want to mention that the day long meditation retreat on Sunday. Um, but I will be back next week, Tuesday. Um, share this with a friend, invite them to come. And, uh, you know, we never know who's going to be here from week to week, but there tends to be like a core group so um yeah like mention this to your friends and let's uh spread the goodness <laughs> there's a lot of people i'm sure who could have used this today um so all right uh thank you for this it was lovely feeling great much more calm yeah great lauren thanks for coming back all right see you later bye 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 Ruth.